Welcome to the Fermented Homestead. If you're new here, my name is Anna, and on this channel, I'm sharing our journey of learning how to turn our home into a homestead. I'm just getting ready. I should have left for the Homesteading Expo 20 minutes ago, but I was editing and I want to make sure I got the video like ready to go so that when I get there, hopefully it will be uploaded enough to be able to post. But anyways, we also need to do our sourdough. So I, I would venture to say we have an active, alive starter. You can see right here, this is where it's at. This is it like, it nearly doubled because it actually started like right down here. So it more than doubled. This is a very active, it's alive. So I've decided, I was originally, I picked out a name, okay. I picked out a name before I did this, or I think it was like day two, day one or two, whatever. Anyways, I had picked out a name. I was gonna name it Fred. And then I realized, no, it was day one. Day one, I was gonna name I was gonna name the starter Fred when it was when it was actually known that it was gonna live. Um, but Fred, I realized Fred wouldn't wear this, so I have since decided to name it Francine. So meet Francine, guys. We're gonna feed it day three, day four. Is it day four? Yes, it is feeding number three. But is it day four of it being born? I don't know. Whatever. It's. It's our fourth day of putting flour in a jar. Okay, so I don't, I, I haven't figured out how, how the professional people who keep sourdough starters alive for more than a couple weeks manage to do this portion of it. But what I'm gonna do for today is I'm gonna take out, since there's 450 grams of stuff in here, we're gonna take out 300 grams of stuff from here and put it in a separate jar to save for a discard later because this is active starter, so I can start saving it now and uh, or start using it. So we're gonna go ahead and just uh, take out 350 grams. <laughs> How about that? Almost exactly. 301. Okay, so we're gonna put this one just in the fridge. And this guy, I think we'll do like two more days of just straight rye feeding. And then after that, um, we'll try and incorporate some more, some just some regular flour. So 100, whoa, holy crap, 150 grams, some water. That'll do. Francine her top back. And that's all there is to it. We started a sourdough starter and we're ready for sourdough September. No, okay. <laughs> uh, so on and on and on right now it's it's firm. Um, and so it's I don't know how to explain it. It feels like uh this part of your hand. And I mean it's so a little bit squishy, but you can you can feel like there's a muscle in there, right? As I keep milking, if she stops milking and it still feels like that, she's holding back on you. She's not dropping her milk, which she might she might try to kick me. I apologize. Um, she's not used to this. Uh, but if she's not dropping, you would do what a cat does and you hit it. So cat, if she stops dropping milk, he's gonna take his head and head butter. But when you're milking and she stops dropping, you stop her. You punch your other, you snap her, you do something. It's the same feeling as a cat hitting her. It's not going to hurt her. It might startle them and be like, I don't know what the heck you just did. Uh, but usually after like a little snap, she'll drop more milk. And if you are cat sharing, if you happen to leave milk in there, it's no big deal. That cat is going to immediately check your work. He's going to be like, did you miss any? Because I want some. Um, and she's gonna love them. So. But typically around a month old, they can to like nibble at grass. If you're, yeah, I mean, there's no. You can turn, it's fine. Oh, apparently she's done. So <laughs> that was her rose, the nine year old. Yay! It's windy All right. though. It is windy, but hopefully it'll be fine. 
hopefully. Crunch if fingers. not, then I'm gonna hunt you down later. I'll I know. listen to hey, it. Hey, we gotta redo it. Yeah, we have to redo it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, let's start over. <laughs> I'm here at the. Oh, start over again. I, I'm Ozark's here at the Ozark Setting Expo. That's the one. And I wanted to make sure that I introduced you here. So go ahead. Yeah, my now. name's Emma. Uh, channel's uh, Sonny's Place, S O N N I E S, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm in mid Missouri. Uh, city girl, grew up in Southern California, married a country boy, and learning how to homestead, learning how to grow our own food, raise our own meat, and yeah, just doing the things, building a lot of stuff, love to build stuff. She has an amazing Cornish Cross series, and you're still working on it, right? Yeah, I it's am, yeah, we're, we're wrapping it up next week, actually, yeah. Amazing, check it out yeah. if you want to learn how to do Cornish Crosses, or if you just want to check out some awesome videos. Yeah, <laughs> I love it, yay! Ah, thank you! Sourdough has a lot of health benefits. Um, I know one thing is uh, a sourdough, um, it unlocks nutrients. I have a guy who is just a baker and has read some books and has Google. So uh, <laughs> I am not a doctor or a medical professional, so please don't sue me. One of the health benefits that sourdough has from a long fermentation is that it breaks down gluten. There have been friends of mine who have had gluten intolerance, and I've given them sourdough bread, and they've been able to eat it. It's it's more digestible. It's easier for the gut. Uh, you know, again, that it all goes back to the lactic acid. The lactic acid is is the main thing. It breaks down everything. Um, another thing is it breaks down nutrients. Uh, there's a there's a in in whole wheat flour. There's a thing called, I think it's phytate, that inhibits um, minerals from being absorbed into you know, the bloodstream and, and the body. Well, sourdough breaks down that phytate and allows all the minerals and nutrients to be absorbed in, into the body. Also, for people who possibly are diabetic, um, it, sourdough might, might be a thing for people to eat because uh, because of the long fermentation, spikes in your uh, blood sugar. Again, because it goes, those sugars go slowly through your bloodstream. With your sourdough starter, you can actually change the flavor to your liking. Uh, I'm not gonna get into the scientific names here, but, but if you have a sourdough starter that um, is, is at like, uh, the water temperature is at 59, to I think seven, seven, uh, 72 degrees, your your um, sourdough starter is going to be more vinegary, more sharp. If you want more of a yogurty kind of uh, creamy flavor, you have your water temperature at 80 to 100 degrees. Yeast will do what yeast will do. So that so that's the main takeaway. That it's called wild yeast for a reason. Uh, it's hard to tame and it does what it wants to do. My name is Clyde and I've developed a very handy vegetable planting slide chart. It works all over the country. Come on up close and I'll show you. It's got a, a um, horizontal calendar and a sliding frost line and what you do is you slide that frost line to your local frost date. If you're up in the north and in, uh, in Nebraska and it's closer to May and June and if you're down in Louisiana it's in February. Here in our area it's uh, mid-April, okay, and once the frost line is in place, each column is a week and it gives you the first outdoor planting date for each garden vegetable. The indoor seeding dates are also marked so you know when to put your flats out in the house, which is a great way to save money on your garden. And then the green chip marks, they give you the expected harvest date and see how there's a little legend down below there, mm -hmm. okay. so. <clears throat> Uh, you know, like things like peas and spinach and cabbage, they plant early ahead of the frost. But things like peppers and tomatoes, they're tender and have to wait until the danger of frost is passed. And so I've incorporated the frost-free date into the chart so that you have a 90% chance of success if you plant past those dates, okay? okay. Pull it open and it gives you the seed quantity for a 10-foot row, the planting depth, the distance between rows and between plants so you don't get them too congested together. The sunlight requirements because a lot of people have areas of their yard that has partial sun. Mm -hmm. Well some of these plants are good for partial sun. The minimum soil temperature for germination 
A lady from um, Amarillo, Texas asked me to add that. She said, people are buying the seats from me and they're putting them in the ground too early. They don't realize that if the ground isn't warm enough, you shouldn't plant it yet. Then the seeds spoil and then they come back to me and ask for more seeds and it's not my fault, okay? Mm -hmm. So what you do is you get a cheap thermometer, test your soil, like $2 from Walmart, okay? Yeah. And put the, put the thermometer in the soil in the afternoon or in the evening after the sun goes down so there's no shining of the sun on it. Leave it in there for a half hour, check the soil. If it's above this temperature right here, you can go ahead and do your planting, okay? If it's not, you need to wait. Uh, this is the expected yield. Say your family wants to produce or um, can uh, 80 pounds of green beans, okay? Well, how many rows am I going to need? Well, uh, it's 20 pounds of green beans per 10 foot row. So you can do some quick multiplying. I need 40 feet of row for canning. And then I'm going to need some other beans and additional rows for eating during the summer. I don't know about you, but I love green beans and potatoes together. Mm -hmm. Fermented beans too. Uh, really good. This is your natural companions when you plant companions with this one here they nourish one another under the ground so if you're still learning about companion planting this is an ideal way the chart is an ideal way to, to learn that wow. this is the spring side of your chart mm -hmm. for spring gardening you roll it over slide it to your full frost date last planting weeks to have a nice fall garden That's and <clears throat> there's also a, a video demo online at my website you can have coffee and be refreshed of how to use the chart. Okay, I'll make yeah. sure to link that down below. And we discovered that people are moving out of the cities and they hadn't had any experience with gardening. Mm -hmm. This is helping them a lot. And I really appreciate you sharing with your people. Absolutely. And can I give you some charts to give away to your people? If you'd like to, yeah. yeah. I how know, they would that? love it. Yeah. That'd be awesome. So that kind that of way it kind of calls attention to it and. And that'll be good for me and good for you too. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we'll be giving this away probably in the next couple of days and we'll figure out some way directly from Clyde. And thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. You good show. Oh, I was like, what is that line? <laughs> it's my wrinkles. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was the microphone, but that's hilarious. Okay. Go ahead. All right, my name is Mickey Adcox. I'm from Tipton, Missouri, and I sell bag holders, and I sell these towels, um, aprons for adults and for children. What else do I sell? I sell face scrubbers. I sell paperless paper towels, coffee filters that are reusable. You name it, if it's for the kitchen, I sell it. So Awesome. I'll be sure to link her email down below, and you can get in touch with her. Yes, thank you very much. I will ship anywhere for free. You want to read. If Cornish Cross are really good eating, but they are more acceptable to diseases and killing off, you know, dying off. So um, pros and cons. Cornish Cross grows super fast. They're delicious, but they're gross and fat and lazy, and they're not super sustainable. You've got to eat a lot more grain than your Red Rangers. If you just want to raise them and and just look for the meat, Cornish Cross is the way you go. But Red Rangers want... take an extra month or two months. They, they're they more active. They're more like a real chicken. Yeah. But sometimes they, they don't taste grass. as great as the Cornish Cross. So it's a trade-off when you pick it where to go. Yeah, we're on an acre farm. And it, it, the fence went all the way around our house. Yeah. And I'm like, what are we going to do with the emu? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a little bit. So but, usually I had to come up with a story of like, so when I got the peacocks, I was like, oh, they won't be, they'll stay here. They won't fly up in the trees. <laughs> we'll, we'll get these emus. They'll, they'll grow full size in like 10 years. Yeah. And they'll be, they'll be small. If anybody, anybody have emus out there? Anybody? No? No? So emus grow really fast. They're about this tall when you hatch them out. And they grow about a foot a month. And so this was in our house, and then this was in our house, and then that was in our house, like that. And uh, we were like, wow, we got to start finding a place outside for this guy. And so we had bamboo the emu, and yeah. we said, we got to find a house for him. I really started to love this little guy. I think I was changing guy. enough emu diapers as much as kids' diapers, and I was like, no, this is not working out. <laughs> Typical homestead problems, right? Changing emu diapers. So we'll just move them every so often when we see the grass is dying down in there, move it. And it's amazing how the grass grows 
When you look out on the when you look out on the entire farm where these chicken tractors go, how green it is. The green the grass is so full, so tall, it's amazing. And so obviously the Joel Salton guy you're talking about knows what he's doing because rotational grazing can really be helpful if you need to restore some kind of land that's been beaten up or never had good pasture rotation, things like that. Hey, I'm Amy with Dirt and Devotion and we sell apparel for home centers, gardeners, urban gardeners, or anyone in between. So check us out, www.dirtanddevotion.com. You want to spell what in devotion? Dirt, D -I, yep, Dirt, D-I-R-T and A-N-D, Devotion, D-E-V-O-T-I-O-N.com. Awesome, I'll Thanks. link it down below. Okay, cool. Go through and instead of plucking the chicken, they will go through and they will skin the chicken. Okay? I don't like skinning the chicken. It's way too much work, way too hard to do. There's some other parts of the chicken. Uh, as you take the internal parts out, uh, some people want to save them, some people don't. Uh, the heart, okay? Mm -hmm. The gizzard, okay? That's where they grind everything up. And the liver. Uh, a lot of people cut those up and put it in like a chili gravy or different things like that. Uh, I think chili gravy is a waste of chicken liver. Okay? Uh, and gizzards, I read for two months to make a chew. Okay? Chop them up, do whatever else you want to do. But save me the chicken liver and fry them up. To be a homesteader, you're going to end up being a jack of all trades and probably a master of none. My wife and I, Pathways Homestead is where you can find us on YouTube. We raise about 80% of our own food. We raise about 80% of our own food. And uh, that includes not only our food, but we raise food for other people. We sell food at our farmer's market. And one of the things we sell is pasture poultry. We process about 300 birds a year for ourselves and for our market. It's sovereign to me. And anytime I take a life, it, it weighs heavy on me. And uh, guys, I grew up processing, I worked as a commercial butcher, um, and I, sadly, I can't tell you the first time I got to take an animal because it's, I was that young that I don't remember it. So that's been my lifestyle, but I'm still tell you this is seriously, um, it's not something I ever take lightly. First of all, um, I'm a Jesus follower. And so I believe that Jesus Christ came to this earth, died on the cross, shed his blood to pay for my sin. And I believe that he gave his life to give me eternal life. I do believe he rose again and he's still alive. But when I take an animal's life to give me temporal life, it's a stark reminder of what's been done for me. So every time I process an animal, it's a worship experience for me. It's a reminder of my redeemer. And so it's very serious. And I know Wayne takes it's very serious too. Um, and, and that's because of that. So, um, guys, the very first animal that was ever taken that's recorded in the book of Genesis is the animal that God took to take his skin to cover Adam and Eve's sin, sinfulness. And blood covers sin. Jesus' blood covers our sin. So when we're taking this animal's blood and its life, it is a stark reminder. So I was wanting, I'm here with White House on a Hill at the Ozark, uh, Ozark Homesteading Expo nice. and I just wanted to um, bring you guys along and ask you guys what is, what about birds in particular brings you joy? Because it clearly brings you joy, but like what is it, what is it about birds? We just love new experiences, trying out different breeds, ex kind of exploring the whole the whole thing with them because we loved getting chickens for eggs, for meat, and then we got to a point where we're like, what's what's new and different? And we love hatching out birds. We love trying different breeds. And so I think that's what makes us excited is, is egg colors and egg breeds, um, experimenting and um, either with, with crossing different breeds or with finding new breeds that we haven't seen before. That's what we love and we're really passionate about. It definitely shows. It's fun to watch. So thank you. Awesome. Yeah. So we're here with Joyce from Moore's Patch of Heaven. We've been hanging out all day, Yay. pretty much yesterday yes. and today. And so I just wanted to, if you don't already know about her channel, I want to, to give you the opportunity Aww. to introduce yourself. I am Joyce from Moore's Patch of Heaven Homestead. Um, my husband and I recently 
bought um, 10 acres with an abandoned house. Um, so we're going on this crazy little journey. We're living in an RV with two children, <laughs> which has been no, he went crazy. But anyway, um, so we are rebuilding, sorry, I have a mint in my mouth. We are re <laughs> rebuilding the abandoned house for our daughter and son-in-law, and then we are going to build a metal house. So we do some canning, some fermenting, just a little bit some of everything. fermenting. She's yeah. a fermenting queen. She did no. a course here today. No. Or yesterday. This, this one is. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, um, yeah, if you are into some of that stuff and you'd be interested in checking us out, come on this journey with us. Link we, them down below. Thanks. My name is Zach and I'm the founder of Lemongraft. Uh, Lemongraft.com is a, it's a website that allows you to shop in all of your neighbors' backyards, see what everyone in the community is growing, and then you can buy and sell local homegrown food with your neighbors. Um, it's kind of like Airbnb or Uber, uh, but for food. So it's a very efficient supply chain. It just allows the community to come together and take ownership of their food system um, and really just build food community. Um, I'm not sure if you have any, any That's questions. Really cool. Yeah, you, there's three roles on the platform that you can be. Uh, you can be a grower, you can be a host, or a buyer. Um, uh, or you can be all three, or any combination of those. Um, so a host has a, a location that allows growers to list their products online through that host location. And then buyers can purchase all sorts of products from dozens of growers. Uh, and then once the grower makes a sale, um, they drop off with the host. The host receives it and they prepare it for the buyer and they hand it off to the buyer. And so growers are no longer having to bring product to market that they didn't already sell. Oh. Um, and so they're only bringing to market products that they've sold. So it's very efficient for, for growers, much more profitable. We're seeing like between two and five times more profitable than other forms of going to market. Um, and they don't have to um, you know, spend all their time sitting on the farmer's market and uh, doing a lot of these upfront costs to just, just to get to the consumer. And are you guys nationwide? We're accessible everywhere in the U.S. Um, and we're working with people in the communities uh, who want a, a, a like a, a sustainable food system for their for their community. We're working with them to get their community launched. Uh, we'll do lots of stuff for them, like professional photo shoot, uh, get, setting up their inventory for them, getting connected. But the, but we try to work with people in the community so that way we can uh, build those relationships uh, more. We're just wrapping up at the Ozark Homesteading Festival. We just ended and did a chicken butchering class, and we were all attending. So I figured I would go ahead and let you guys know about their channel. Uh, nine acre farms, I can't remember. Pathways Homestead. Pathways Homestead. And so I figured I'd let them introduce you to them and let them tell you about their channels. Hi, I'm Cindy with Pathways Homestead. We are a small 11 acre homestead. We raise 80 to 85% of our food year round. We raise our own beef, pork, chicken, lamb, rabbit, and quail, and duck. We raise our own duck, chicken, and quail eggs and we have big gardens and we also have a lot of fun canning and doing homesteading things. Awesome. So I'm Dale from Nine Acre Family Farms. My wife Lisa and I, we have nine acres. We do market gardening. We raise pa chickens on pasture, egg production, uh, pigs on pasture. We do farmer's market and we have adventures where we go and see other channels and learn about their farm. Awesome. Great. Thank you guys Thank so much you. for sharing. Thanks for coming. It was great to meet you. It was great to meet you too. I'm going to close out the video if you want to. Yeah. All yeah. right. So if you guys are new around here, we just moved to our 30 acre homestead in Southern Missouri, where we are sharing with you how we're turning our home into a homestead. And I like to share with you videos on uh, all kinds of food preservation, canning, freezing, dehydrating, and fermenting, as well as sharing with you how you can include those foods in your everyday cooking. If that sounds awesome to you, click this button right here. This is the subscribe button. This is what tells YouTube you want to come back here. Up here is a video that Mr. Google Pants thinks that you're going to enjoy. This here is my last video and then up here is the uh every bit counts challenge playlist make sure you check that out for all the awesomeness see you later thanks for watching bye, bye. bye.